Welcome to the basics of rheology with a focus on food rheology, an application of rheology. With this video, we're going to try something a little different. Instead of covering a particular topic, we're going to use rheology to answer a question. We were given two samples labeled 594 and 131 and asked, are these samples rheologically different? To answer this question, we were given access to a couple of rheometers and a Brookfield viscometer and given three hours to provide evidence to prove if the samples were rheologically different or similar. As part of this video, we will walk you through the tests and analysis that we went through to answer this question. So let's get started. So after looking at our samples, we realized that both of them had hard chunks in them. So for all of our tests on the rheometers, we made sure not to include the chunks and the samples that were tested. Also, the samples for all the tests were run in triplicate. So back to looking at our samples. The samples were of similar color, and the sample 594 seemed to have a higher viscosity or more resistant to flow than sample 131. So, we started by testing the sample's viscosity on the Brookfield viscometer. As a reminder, with the Brookfield, you place a spindle into your sample, and the Brookfield determines viscosity by the amount of torque required to move the spindle. For our testing, we recorded the viscosity every 15 seconds for 5 minutes. Unless otherwise stated, in our graphs, sample 594 will be indicated with green circles, and sample 131 will be indicated with blue triangles. When we plotted viscosity over time, we noticed that the samples had different viscosity and that the sample 594 had a higher viscosity. Next, we performed a shear rate sweep on a DHR3 rheometer to determine if we could fit these samples to a model this test increased the shear rate being experienced by the sample gradually and measured the resistance provided by the sample in pascals. The graph plots shear rate against shear stress. It shows that both of these samples fit the power law model the best, with shear thinning behavior indicated because the exponent, or n, was less than 1. With the shear rate sweep, we also get an apparent viscosity against shear rate graph and we can see that both samples are shear thinning and that 594 does indeed have a higher viscosity. Lastly, we ran a frequency sweep on the Anton Parr 302 rheometer to determine the dynamic viscosity and the sample's viscoelastic behavior. This test increases the frequency or how often a constant strain was applied to the sample. With this graph of dynamic viscosity against angular frequency, we can see that the sample 594 still has a higher viscosity than sample 131, which is in accordance with the other viscosity readings we have been seeing throughout this video. Also, from the frequency sweep, we get this graph of G prime, G double prime, plotted against angular frequency. Unlike previous graphs, which used green circles to mark sample 594 and blue triangles to mark sample 131, for this graph, the green triangles and blue triangles will mark G prime, which is a storage modulus, and the green and blue squares will mark G double prime, which is the loss modulus. This shows that for G prime, or storage modulus, which indicates the elastic or solid-like behavior is higher than G double prime or the loss modulus, which indicates viscous or fluid-like behavior. From this, we can gather that both samples have higher storage modulus, meaning that they are elastic or solid dominant, while sample 594 has a higher storage modulus than the sample 131, meaning it has more elastic dominance than sample 131. In conclusion, if we look back at our data, we realize that both samples are shear thinning and followed the power law, but that sample 594 had a higher viscosity and had a higher storage and loss modulus. So to answer the original question, the samples are 
rheologically different. However, this is just the start of what tests we could have run to differentiate these two samples. If we had had three more hours to perform more tests, we would have performed both a strain sweep and a large amplitude oscillatory shear, or Lous test, to understand the linear viscoelastic region of the sample and how it acts outside the linear viscoelastic region. If we had had unlimited time and money to perform tests on the samples, we would do tests to identify differences in specific components of the samples with high-performance liquid chromatography, or test the moisture content with a vacuum oven, or test fat content with the Mejanier method, or additional tests to determine what is causing sample 594's higher viscosity. On a closing note, running samples is not that difficult. The harder part is knowing if the data you are collecting makes sense and in interpreting that data. To help with that, you can check out our other videos with the basics of rheology and the world of rheology. Thank you for watching our video and how we used rheology to differentiate two samples. Enjoy learning more about the wonderful world of rheology.